Okay, so welcome and thank you for joining us today for the meeting of the New York City Health and Hospitals Finance Committee meeting. This meeting is officially called to order. Uh, so Frida Wang is is uh, participating in the meeting on a in a listening capacity, uh, virtually. Uh, let me go to bylaw section 14, committee attendance. If any member of a standing or special committee of the board will be presented at a scheduled committee meeting, the member may ask the chair of the board to request that another board member, not a member of that committee, attend the scheduled meeting and be counted as a member for purposes of quorum and voting. Therefore, Ferioski Peña Mora has requested that, that Erin Kelly, representing Ann Williams Eisen, be counted for the purposes of quorum and voting on her behalf. So, and the request was approved. I would like to propose a motion to adopt the minutes of the Finance Committee meeting held on March 13th, 2023. Let me ask for your vote, Dr. Katz. Yes. Sally Landes Pinheiro. Yes. Erin Kelly. Yes. And so, Pagan, yes. Motion is adopted. So, next is an action item for consideration. Mr. Albertson, please read the resolution. Thank you, Dr. Pagan. Uh, let's see. Good morning, my name is Paul Albertson. I'm going to be presenting the uh, application to award a contract for our laundry and linen services. I'll read the resolution here for the committee consideration authorizing the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, the system, to execute an agreement with Sodexo Incorporated, uh, Sodexo for laundry processing and linen distribution <laughs> services for initial term of five years with one one-year option solely exercisable by the system in an amount not to exceed $145,548,888 for the entire contract term. Uh, some brief background here. As I mentioned, this is a request to enter into a contract for end-to-end -end laundry and linen services for the system's acute care and post-acute care facilities. Our current laundry and, laundry and linen services are provided through Sodexo, uh, and Sodexo was selected as the systems partner as an outcome of an RFP in 2011 with the closure of the Brooklyn uh, laundry plant uh, and entered into a nine-year agreement, which ended in June of 2020. Um, in 2020, it became um, not possible to finalize the on-site operational assessment for vendor walkthroughs to finalize a solicitation in 2020. And so Sodexo developed a proposal to improve those services with enhanced management and staffing uh, in 2020. And a two-year agreement with a one-year renewal option was, improved, uh, was approved in May of 2020 by the board as a best interest renewal, which ends this June 30th. The not to exceed on the existing contract is $50,438,922. The expected total contract spend is $51,338,922 uh, due to additional linen and laundry costs related for increased volumes and processing. Uh, there is also an additional related spend related to COVID of $8,161,078 authorized by emergency deviation. Um, so over the last uh, three years here, uh, Sodexo has built on their existing strengths, uh, a strong linen laundry vendor with detailed contingency plans, providing end-to-end -end supply and management of all linen for all of our patient care areas, uh, organized our linen distribution program, uh, a 98% daily linen fill rate, and enhanced policies and protocols, which became so important during uh, the infection prevention highlighting with COVID. Um, we also, as promised, added two regional directors, upgraded our staff supervision, um, and reduced our emergency department linen utilization by 52% through the imp implementation of technology for our linen management that helps to control the distribution for our EMS staff uh, who uh, visit us uh, regularly with an annual savings of more than a million dollars. So we've also established linen committees and some technology to help on developing power levels on a day-to-day -day basis. For our RFP criteria, 
that we were really looking for vendors with at least five years of experiencing having a local uh, distribution plant close enough to drive uh, back and forth every day and a significant revenue in, in excess of $50 million to assure their skill set and capabilities. Our criteria in a substantive manner in reviewing the proposals, we're really looking at our uh, management plan and experience, the technology, uh, the cost, references, and our diversity uh, spent. Uh, for our evaluation committee, we asked two of our chief operating officers to serve as co-chairs, uh, which they did. We had a facility administrator, our corporate director of infection prevention, uh, a nursing representative, a facilities management representative, post-acute care and management services. So in reference to our uh, procurement process, last October, uh, we received approval from the CRC, the Contract Review Committee, to solicit a uh, request for proposals. We posted the RFP at the city record in December and then had um, pre-proposal conferences with the vendors. We structured walkthroughs at our 16 locations that utilize our linen and laundry services for the vendors, had a follow-up conversation with the, comp with the um, vendors and then received our responses from the RFP in the middle of January of this year. We had the firms conduct in-person presentations to the committee at Jacoby, and then the committee had follow-up questions and further interviewed the committee members by WebEx. The evaluation process was completed in early April. Sodexo was the selected vendor, and the application to award the contract was approved uh, later uh, that month by the contract review committee. So as noted, we've uh, had the Sodexo selected by the committee to continue being our partner for linen and laundry services, uh, that they're gonna be providing a cap on linen uh, loss expenses. Um, and despite our overall increase in patient days in emergency department, uh, usage, which has increased our linen and laundry costs. They'll also continue to enhance the on-site on staffing at our facility, facilities for longer daily uh, staff access and better linen management, and also due to additional patient care units opening at several facilities. We're gonna continue our ScrubX uh, dispensing system for our perioperative and labor and delivery personnel. Um, and we have a uh, plan to expand our linen management system uh, machinery at um, the new South Brooklyn Health Tower as an opportunity to evaluate its capabilities. Sodexo will also be implementing a new linen laundry software system for automated tracking later this year. Our vendor performance um, document is attached, uh, which um, our group rated as satisfactory throughout all of the questions here. Um, they've continued to um, meet the MWBE utilization plan goals and actually exceeding it. Our, our plan uh, had a 17% goal and they have um, regularly uh, hit 24% over the last three years. Um, and with that, I'm requesting that uh, approval to award a contract to Sodexo to provide the linen and laundry systems for the system at a not to exceed amount of $145,548,888. Uh, the requested contract terms is five years with a one year renewal option at the discretion of the system with the start date of July 1st of this year. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Any questions from board members? Okay, hearing none, then let me ask for a vote, uh, Dr. Katz. Yes. Sally Andes Pinero. Yes. Karen Kelly. Yes. And Jose Pagan. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let's move to the next one, Ms. Perez. Good morning. So thank you for um, letting us present on uh, moving forward with a contract uh, for Health Resources Optimization Inc. or our HROI addressing our DRG downgrade denials. So we are looking for um, organizations not to exceed 
$6,820,780 over a five-year contract. Background and overview is that New York City Health and Hospitals receives on average about 420 DRG downgrades denial a month. This is estimated a potential loss of $22.7 million a year. Um, and just to um, familiarize some, some that are not familiar with what DRGs are, DRG stands for Diagnostic Related Groups. It is the basis for which each episode of an inpatient hospital stays are reimbursed. It is based on a combination of acute and chronic diagnosis and procedures reported to the payer. The denials are based on removing one of these diagnoses, which changes the DRG and decreases the reimbursement. Uh, but we are given the opportunity to uh, response. However, we are given a very short <laughs> to do so. Uh, the previous vendor contract ended in 2022, and currently we are working with a, um, a, a vendor in the interim, um, Ms. Cloud Med, and uh, to support these um, on a month-to-month -month basis. We are seeking to acquire a stable firm contract. It is expected that the firm will provide these ser support services to all 11 New York City Health and Hospitals acute sites. Um, they will be working the overflow denials and um, as well as the process of writing them, follow up and um, ensuring that we get, we actually we hold and maintain the reimbursement. Um, the estimated recovery for this is about equal or greater to 30%. It is a contingency cost per year estimated to be uh, $1,364,056, totaling over $6 million, totaling to, sorry, $6,820,780 over the five years. You can see here, I did include a monthly, the monthly numbers um, and the yearly recovery estimates. Um, the average monthly is of the DRG denials is about $1.9 million. The yearly loss, 22.7, as mentioned before, the recovery of 30% um, is expected to be estimated at 6.8 million. Um, and here you also will see the um, yearly cost payment to the vendor as well as the expected re recovery over the five years of $34 million and the cost of that five-year contract. Here is uh, the criteria. So uh, these, uh, the criteria for the contract was a five-year experience um, in the revenue cycle, addressing specifically the DRG downgrades, with the expertise in coding and clinical review uh, for this denial process, addressing the most difficult DRGs, uh, commonly uh, denied diagnosis and overflow of, of um, denials. Um, here on our committee, you can see a representation of stakeholders in the process. We had a CFO uh, from a facility, as well as a director from the facility, director of the revenue integrity, director of IT, as well as a director from our revenue cycle. The substantive criteria was 90% uh, evenly split across the cost and the experience and 10% for our MWBD. This process did um, take place over uh, beginning in October. We put our RFP, was posted to the record. Eight vendors um, responded on the following week, October 13th, we did have six vendors attend a question and answer session um, to go over any outstanding questions they may have had. We, on November 10th, we proposed a deadline. Four proposals were received. And since we received only four proposals, the thought was to allow all four to have a presentation. Um, and of course, this occurred the following uh, month between December 6th and December 12th, um, in which we, we had the proposals uh, presented from all four vendors. The evaluation, the evaluation committee uh, did have our debriefing the following week, 
Um, vendors submitted their best and final pricing in February of this year, 2023. And the evaluation committee submitted our final scores following that, um, as well as um, as well as uh, the references were checked, and HROI was the highest graded proposal. If we look at their um, the MWB analysis here, you'll see that only one vendor. Uh, Four vendors responded, they all met goals, but only one had a is HROI. And the idea is to funnel over 30% to that subcontractor, which is best mature. So we are seeking uh, the, the approval to move ahead uh, with these services with HROI. They serve over uh, 100 providers in the New York City, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. We are requesting to, to move forward with this contract of three years of contract with them and two one-year options, not to exceed the six million three hundred and twenty thousand seven hundred and eighty dollars Any questions? Thank you. Any questions? So the, the 30% um, recovery rate, and the 20% uh, charge, are, are those, so when, when, a, when if I submit a bid, uh, if I bid on the contract, do I use those numbers or do I, like if I'm a, like the four firms that, that were involved in this, do they submit different rates or different, do they make different promises when it comes to what they can recover and what they charge or how does that work? Well, yeah, so how it works is that over a certain amount of money, they will give us a discount. How it works is that they will make a contingency on what they keep. So it's the difference of what was denied and a percentage of that potential denial amount that's being taken back. So they make the 20% off of that denial. But they but they all presented different proposals when it comes to the fee they charge or what? They did all present different proposals on the contingency rate which is why procurement went back and asked them for a best and final. I'm guessing, and I was not on the selection committee, I'm guessing that um, the initial feedback, there were a couple of close calls in terms of vendors. So they went for a best and final to see if that would help make the decision. In terms of the overturn rate, that's our estimate of how many of these would be overturned in order to create a budget for this. And does the, does the vendor have, do they have any risk when it comes to like, let's say that I don't take any, um, I don't know, I I go into it and do the work, but then then uh, I don't deliver on the 30% recovery or is, it, is there a way in which you can switch to a different vendor or how does that work? We well, could not refer to them. We could choose to not refer cases to them if we don't find that they're, uh, you know, we don't have any threshold in the contract that says, you know, they're counting on 100 cases a month or, or anything like that. Um, so, but their incentive is in fact a contingency rate. Yes. But if they're underperforming, you can always decide to to uh, stop sending business to them in that at that point. Yep. But if they don't perform, they don't get paid. So why, why, what are you thinking? Why wouldn't that be um, sufficient to motivate? I mean, these are some big dollars, right? Yeah. They're not a trivial, yeah. it's not, if you win the case, right? It's not a trivial yeah. amount of money you're going to get. I'm just thinking about like, if you're basically being the only person that can do this work. So um, if if a person is not performing, then you just give the con the right DRG the denial to someone else. Yeah. So we do that with other vendors. We have you know a couple of vendors in the mix, um, and we've had limited success with that too. We find sometimes it's better to give. This is not a huge um, number of cases for any one firm, so to split them felt like they might not have enough vested in us. I see. If they didn't have a lot of cases, it, it it's always a fine line. Okay. Any any other any questions? Okay, so let me ask for a vote. Uh, Dr. Katz? Yes. Sally Hernandez Pinero? Yes. Erin Kelly? Yes. And Jose Paganis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
so let's see. So financial update. Well, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Um, yeah, so this is uh, just a quick report on how we closed out the third quarter. Um, you know, our cash situation in March was very strong, 925 million, 37 days cash out of hand. That's exceptional for us. Uh, in part, that was driven by a big, we're just talking about the UPL payments and how we uh, got behind with CNS. Uh, so we've actually uh, managed to recover those funds. So that's what's helping the bottom line there. Um, and still strong in April, I think uh, James will cover, I think it was but you know, very strong margins, maybe 650 million there. So not not bad. Uh, direct patient care receipts still strong year to year, 46 and a half million dollars. So it's you know sustaining itself. Volumes right are back. Uh, inpatient back and outpatient is running eight percent ahead. Uh, we still are seeing a negative budget variance. Um, of about 1% or 118 million. Uh, at the close of the second quarter, I think we were running behind about 90 million uh, and have a forecast of, you know, finishing the year at about 145. Um, we are taking steps at this point. We've been talking to the seat, tightening up on our spending. The situation that's driving the gap is the same that we reported uh, at our last committee meeting. It's, it's primarily due to temp nurses and temp doctors, which are expensive, very expensive. Um, that coupled with just inflationary, you know, pressures on the supply chain, you know, drugs and other other goods and services. Uh, so we are addressing it, you know, we're not, you know, too nervous at this point, but it does make sense to take some steps to slow and pause, you know, spending as we, uh, you know, begin to line ourselves up to exit the year. We do have a plan, we think, to close that gap. A lot of things have to fall into place. Uh, primarily, again, gets back to getting uh, prospective with the transactions that we have with the CMS and the Department of Health around UPL. So we, we feel like we have a pathway to get there. You know, James keeps what we call the checkbook. It's just a process by which we start to focus our efforts on, on closing out the year. So we, we feel we feel okay. We feel pretty good. Um, uh, and we'll take take the steps, I think, here to try to, you know, finish at least perhaps a break even. So that's highlights there. This is, I think, what I just said. Uh, April, you know, closed at 650 million. May, we expect 600 million, uh, you know, continuing to work, you know, with uh, the city just on our overall cash management. Uh, there was another peg uh, issued by OMB. Maybe, James, you want to? I'm sure I can quickly yeah. cover on it. So, as in the city's executive budget, which was released um, in late April. Um, most city agencies received a 4% peg on their city tax levy portion of their budget. Um, so for us, that translates to about 15 to $16 million per year, as you can see on the table at the bottom. Um, and we worked with the city just given sort of how only a portion of our budget runs through them and through the city tax levy that um, it would effectuate through a subsidy reduction on our side that we will then translate into meeting it with internal initiatives related to revenue enhancement and expenditure savings, similar to the targets that Paul's John just laid out. And then last is, um, you know, the the governor's office and the legislature reached an agreement on the budget. Um, we're in the process of going through the, what they call the scorecard and the budget bills, better understand what, what is the uh, you know, the conclusion of the budget. Uh, we did, we do have a chart which we can make available to you. We just didn't have enough time to get it into the package, but just to kind of quickly go through, we had last time presented positives and negatives on the positive side of the ledger, uh, rather significant increase in the Medicaid rate of seven and a half percent for inpatient, uh, six and a half percent increase for nursing homes and FQHCs. Uh, there's a big rate increase um, in the essential plan uh, targeted at inpatient uh, services. We're still, again, trying to get a handle on what does that mean for us, but obviously good news. Uh, the $1 billion capital transformation fund uh, proposed by the governors in the final budget. And then the governor had a lot of significant issues um, involving uh, supplementing behavioral health investments, about a billion dollars. Those made their way into the final budget and we're trying to better understand what opportunities that might uh, provide for health and hospitals. 
the extension of the UPL conversion authorization statute was put in statute a number of years ago, but needed to be extended in the law, and it was. Uh, new reimbursement opportunities for a variety of other, you know, services. Um, uh, obviously, you know, uh, another, we think, smart investments as it relates to trying to bolster the provision of, of those services, a 4% COLA for human services, and then the restoration of the quality pools that were proposed to be eliminated uh, were all restored. So overall, I think, uh, you know, positive for us. On the negative side, uh, the 340B uh, pharmacy carve-out proposal did go live under the, you know, the existing law. It was not overturned uh, on April 1st. We'll have to watch that carefully as it rolls out. Continuation of the capital rate cut, which we've opposed from a couple of years ago, uh, was not restored. Uh, we've been, you know, participating with the safety net hospitals. They they were afforded a seven hundred or eight hundred million dollar increase in the previous year that was reduced to five hundred million dollars. So that was necessary a, a year to year cut for them. Uh, so there is some you know, good reasons to continue to, uh, you know, work with our safety net colleagues in, in terms of. Uh, you know, understanding kind of what the budget means to them. We'll continue that work. And I think maybe disappointingly, there was no new coverage expansions, which we were hoping for the budget. But again, I think opportunity for more discussion there. But we have this chart again, we'll make it available to you. We just didn't have enough time to get in the package. And we're adding up all the numbers and we'll let you know how it plays out. But I think our instincts are uh, that will be a, a slight positive for us overall. So with that, Sure, we'll go into our familiar charts here. Um, as John alluded to in the top half of his presentation, we ended March with a negative variance of 118 million, about 1%. Uh, and again, receipts exceeding budget by 338 million, offset by disbursements also exceeding budget by 456 million. And on the next slide, we can get into the specifics on the balance drivers. So on the revenue side, inpatient outpatient volume rates and cash performance continue to exceed our targets. But the big ticket item that is pushing us ahead are the risk is the risk pool performance. 74% um, of that 188 million to the positive is due to better than expected PMPM PM for the current year. Um, and we are getting paid a little bit of risk for prior reconciliations and other um, non excess medical revenue payments. Um, and then also we have other revenue is above target by 99 million. That's primarily driven by Medicare and Medicaid appeals coming in at 85 million, which we don't budget for. <laughs> On the expense side, it's a continuation, as John stated earlier, of agency patient care temp staffing exceeding target by 285 million um, and other discretionary spend exceeding target by 171 million uh, driven by medical and non-medical supplies and pharmaceuticals combination of um, inflation as well as paying down excess outstanding AP. Um, on this last chart, uh, you can see that FY23 direct patient care revenue is 46.5 million higher than FY22 as stated earlier. Uh, patient revenue continues to improve year over year. It's contributed, um, attributed to a combination of higher volume, solid performance uh, on our ref cycle initiatives um, and sh other strategic initiatives. Uh, and again, compared to the same time last year, discharges are slightly lower by less than 1% um, and visits are up 8%. CMI is, is relatively flat, slightly lower at 2%. Some question. Your, um, with the discretionary spending, um, minus 171 million, is that consistent with past performance or is that unusually high? Uh, it's a bit higher than we saw in the front half of the year um, for a combination of reasons. So when we were actively fixing technical issues that delayed some payments going through, um, and we also are just paying down outstanding AP so, but we, we typically do run a slight deficit on the discretionary spend, but it's a bit inflated on the second half of the year versus what we saw in the last slides. Thanks. Okay, so we typically try to provide some update on revenue cycle and my colleagues, Bob Milliken and Jason Dryden will be talking through our focus on AR days. 
Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Bob Mellican. Um, just want to set the stage a little what uh, day and AR is. It's really a, it's a measure of the healthcare industry. It's a KPI on how we can, and it allows H and H comparison of our accounts receivable to other peer hospitals. Uh, what a day and AR is, it's our total accounts receivable divided by our total charges uh, that we average daily charges over a 91 day period. So we have a $2.4 billion AR divided by our average daily charges of 50 million equates to a 50 days in accounts receivable. The, the table ahead uh, uh, on the screen is really just a, a snapshot of, of a slice of our 50 days in AR. And it's from a Epic dashboard. Epic provides a number of dashboards that allow comparison of key perf performance metrics um, in different areas, denials, automation, financial performance. One of them is accounts receivable. And what we're showing on this slide here is really the comparison of H&H &H on the left for, for six different categories compared to the Epic per median performance, how, how other, all other Epic hospitals in the country perform on the same measure. Um, and really the, the four that we're going to talk about in the green before I turn it over to Jason in, in the red, um, sorry about that, is um, we do we we look at uh, four categories: discharge, not build, and that is a combination of a minimum hold days and the candidate for billing. Uh, minimum hold days is every hospital in the country holds their claims for five days or a period of time before they send them to the payer to accumulate all of the charges. Um, a good example of that would be lab charges are not ready to be billed at the date of discharge on an outpatient or an inpatient. So we we wait five days, get the read on those, enable to put the charge on the claim, and then we're prepared to send those out. The candidate for billing, um, H&H uh, does 3.5 days, Epic Median is 3.6, and that's the number of days in AR after the minimum hold day. So after the five our five day hold day, how long does it take us to get the claim out? And we're holding AR of about 150 million, 175 million, um, for candidate for billing, that's the 3.5 days. Uh, and we do very well in this category compared to Epic uh, peers. The last two are just slices of that coding. It's the owning area of coding. How many days in AR are we holding in coding? Uh, Epic is 1.4, we're just, uh, I'm sorry, Epic is 0.8, we're 1.4. So we're slightly above in that category. Um, in claim errors, those are the billing errors that we have. Uh, and H&H &H is on par. 0.4 to 0.4. So um, these are really the categories that are 100% within our control. That's before we get that bill out the door and really looking at how we compare to others. Uh, on, on the whole, you know, a little bit high on the discharge not bill, but we're, 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 we're uh, epic median across the board on the others. Um, and what we're going to be pivoting to is just those, the, the areas where we do have definite improvement opportunities, self-pay AR, and the outstanding, outstanding insurance balances and accounts receivable. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jason Dryden here, and I'll just pick up from where Bob uh, left off. So here we're looking for opportunities uh, to collect on revenue, and our main uh, opportunity for revenue collection is in our claims that are over uh, 45 days. That's our priority as it is right now. And what we're doing is working across uh, all our facilities to ensure that we have uh, standard work and that we follow the best uh, workflows. Uh, over the last few years, we have done particularly well uh, in our denials, and we're taking that same approach, that same disciplined approach to our outstanding AR in general. Uh, as it is now, we are on the verge of uh, piloting uh, automation in terms of claims follow-up. And what this will do is help us to eliminate uh, repetitive work that's been done by our staff. This means that they'll have more time to do more efficient work and follow up on high dollar accounts. For claims that are less than 45 days, uh, there's not much work to be done here. Uh, what this is, is that we submit claims to the payer and we have to wait for the payer uh, to adjudicate these cases. Uh, we have 1.9 days in variances. These are cases that are paid, but not paid as we expected. Uh, so what we have to do is to make sure that we follow up with the payer 
uh, make sure that our system has the correct uh, expected reimbursement and where we find true underpayments to make sure that we do our appeals so we could get the full payments. And we do have uh, high cost outliers that we have to work and these take a little bit more time. We have to submit medical records, submit itemized bill, bills, excuse me, and then we have to wait for the payers to adjudicate those claims. It, it does take us a while to get them paid, but we have been very successful over the last few years in collecting an outlier uh, payments. We do have two AR days for UPL, and as stated before, we are working with the state, working with our managed care team to ensure that we get those payments finalized. Uh, we stopped receiving uh, UPL payments directly via our remittance in April 2022, but we're hopeful that within the next month or so, we should be uh, receiving payments on those claims. We have about 3.6 days in denials, and as I said before, uh, we have been doing pretty well. Now with denials, we're coming from having a rate of over 25% to where we are as of today at 10.2%, which means that we're actually in the top 25% of Epic users, which is, which is very good. Nonetheless, we still continue to do great work and continue to follow up on our denials to make sure that we get them overturned and get paid. Can I ask you something on that one? How, how, how did you do that? How, how did that happen? The lower the denial rate from 25 to 10 percent right yeah that has been a work uh working with all the facilities with the patient accounts departments working with the pairs making sure that we're billing the claims as they want them to be billed um it's been a lot of painstaking work so i i would say that the the easiest answer to that is we really took sort of a qa process improvement and went through you know the cyclical plan do check act mm -hmm. process um, bringing all of the stakeholders together on a weekly basis for two years, um, every week, and we're still doing it. Um, we monitor the pro, you know, we, we put changes in, whether it's process flow changes, system changes, monitor the process, monitor the progress, move on to the next, you know, root cause analysis, all of the good hard roll up your sleeves work. And that's the exact discipline that we're looking to put here to the AR day's work to understand the drivers, what is in our control to fix, fix it, make sure that the fix worked. It doesn't always work. Put another fix in and, and keep moving. Very impressive. Thanks. Did we get an epic trophy? We did. I sent yes. you. We got a we got a bronze trophy today. Is it electronic or they sent you an actual physical? No, electronic on, and we go on a leaderboard. Um, so yeah, it's all like it's always nice to watch the, the CFOs and the facilities because they can get cups too, right? And they yeah. put them on the mantle and they talk a lot about the. But you got to continue to work hard, right? To keep to keep cup, it. You right? have to keep so your trip. They don't like to lose the cup, but they they, they certainly <laughs> like to get the cup and put it on the mantle. And Just another bragging right. Yeah. South Brooklyn Health has a gold trophy, gold trophy. today in denial. So the system as a whole is bronze, but South Brooklyn Health is gold. And, and gold meaning they're in the top 5% of all Epic users across the board, which is remarkable. Yep. But it's just grinding it out work, right? I think it's, it'll be the same for AR, right? Yep. We, we stay focused, we know the problem, you just gotta keep grinding away at it, right? Thanks. Great, uh, for value-based payment update, uh, I'd love Megan Maher, who leads our managed care team to give us an update here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the, the, the graph that you see here is just tracking our performance of surplus with our Metro Plus and Health First risk contracts. Um, and so you can see that there is an upward uh, slope of those lines, which is good, which means that um, we're continuing to increase the amount of surplus that we're bringing in. Uh, we think that a lot of that is due at least in part to the um, waiver of recertification for Medicaid status, which is going to be sunsetting this June. Um, so certainly we have uh, saturation, saturation in our um, Medicaid managed care lives uh, that we know that that will come down a little bit, um, hopefully not too much. And we have lots of work plans in place to try to recertify as many people as possible. But the takeaway here is that 
um, risk pool surplus is coming in and, and that has been very favorable for us. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a snapshot of a tool that we worked to produce for the hospital leadership. Um, so this is now taking a look. We went through our Metro Plus uh, performance through throughout 2022. So this is a calendar year <laughs> and we wanted to see, okay, how are we doing in the baseline period, which was 2021 compared with our most current performance for 2022 and to show that by hospital. And then in the, the last two columns to show it um, within health and hospitals to see what the average is across our 11 hospitals and then to see where does each hospital rank on these different metrics. So this is just a new tool for hospital leadership to try to get um, into the, the nitty details of why their surplus is performing as it is and what areas there are for improvement. So you can see um, there are green boxes if the trend is moving in the right direction and red boxes if it's moving in the wrong direction. And um, so this was very warmly received by a lot of our leadership. I think they're very hungry for data to see what's happening. So we will be doing additional updates with our health first risk um, populations and continuing to update this for our Metro Plus members. Um, a lot of work that our teams have been focusing on for the last uh, many months is around social determinants of health. And um, there are a few initiatives that managed care has been actively trying to push forward. Uh, one is to work on the coding of social determinant diagnoses on claims, which can specifically update our CRG performance, which brings in additional risk surplus or, or premium dollars, right? That, um, that reflect the acuity of the patients that are attributed to health and hospitals. So there's a lot of work underway to make sure that as we're doing these social determinant of health screenings, um, that we're really trying to capture it on the claims or to send as supplemental data that the plans can receive. Um, starting in this calendar year, there's a new HEDIS metric that's called social determinants of health screening and intervention. And so we've been doing a lot of work with Metro Plus to try to set up supplemental data workflows to make sure that we're capturing when these screenings are taking place. Um, so that will be ongoing work that we'll report back out to you. And then finally, we have several CBO partnerships that are specific to our managed care contracts where we are trying to outreach to members that are risk attributed to us who have need for social determinants of health and really try to engage them uh, where they're at. And so with Metro Plus and Fidelis, we have been working around medically tailored meals and trying to make sure that we do outreach to those members who could benefit um, from the service. We work with God's Love, we deliver um, to try to make sure that uh, they're getting uh, healthy food options. And the goal there is as we're in a value-based contract that um, as their health hopefully improves, we'll see better financial returns on our risk. Um, we also uh, have, we're, we've been exploring uh, care management options for patients that are housed um, through our um, Housing for Health program and trying to figure out what more we can do as patients are housed to make sure that they're getting the care management services they need to um, stay and maintain health. And uh, we also have been working and looking at telemedicine options for those that are medically frail to try to figure out what CBOs could we possibly partner with that's going to engage patients in their homes or, or where, wherever they are um, so that they can get the care that they need. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to figure out how number one and number three work together. Okay. So you, um, you're, say you code for a housing problem, code for a nutrition problem, um, and it's going to be part of your claim, but you're going to supplement that, I guess, with actions. You, I don't know what it takes yes. for you to earn the points that you need. Exactly. So I would say that um, 
the coding is intended to help help provide more transparency on the acuity of the population. And so if the health plan is receiving that information through claims or through data feeds that are coming in that are identifying um, different screenings that were done, that's information that the health plan then can use and then inform us at health and hospitals to say, here are patients at risk for a variety of different needs. And I think that for the third item on this slide, we're doing the best that we can to target to identify patients that have needs that we could outreach to. But it, were we to get more precise, transparent information on the claims or at the point of care as the doctors are treating the patients, I think it just creates a, a more solid feedback loop in then we really should be targeting this cohort of risk members with our CBO partnerships. So all that to say, I'm not sure that we are really um, identifying the patients that are in most need. And the hope is that through more diligent coding, we'll be able to find them and, and outreach and intervene. We hope someday, Sally, that, that the insurers will risk adjust for people with intense social needs. And just to use a medical analogy for DRG, you specify their comorbidity. It doesn't require that you do anything for it. Right, right. There's right. no, right, you get paid more if the person also has diabetes. You may have done nothing for their diabetes. Nothing's required. So uh, many of us have been advocating that the populations that we care for have complex needs mm -hmm. that are never included in DRGs, which only are about medical morbidities. Right, right, right. All right. And our hope is that to further a dialogue that results in recognition that these patients are more difficult to care for, more expensive, and therefore provides the dollars so that we can do these things like food services and housing services. Now, I'm just curious whether you just say for housing needs better housing, which will be like everybody, uh, or <laughs> whether um, uh, one who qualifies in the first instance to be coded as housing poor, or nutrition poor. And then of course, the second question is, what's our responsibility in addressing that, but um, it is the case that so so many of our patients would would ha have housing issues, nutritional issues, and we're we're looking at the most uh, needy of that population. But is that what the federal government is requiring, or can we do it across a broader across a broader expanse of people who are like poorly housed or inadequately housed? You don't have to be homeless, for example, to qualify, right? It's a, it's a very hot topic, I would oh, say. It's a hot to okay. I, I don't I don't know that I have the direct answer to yeah. that question, but there is a lot of discussion at the state level in terms of having a universal screener of what are you capturing in trying to okay. decipher these social determinants of health. Okay. And so our population health team has a screener that we've been using for a long time and you know, there's many questions, policy questions of what does it take to have a screener be certified as legitimate or or specific enough. Um, so I think that will be an evolving area for the next few Okay, years. thank you. But, but certainly the number of people that we code with a social need right. will be greater than the number that we can directly intervene. With, Absolutely. Right? So we have, for example, already 40,000 plus a year patients documented as homeless right. and a goal of targeting 600 people per year for our housing navigator. Exactly. So we just, the, the scale of the investment is different because we have other partners around the city, city agencies who are focused on it as well. So it will be, you know, layers down. Okay, thank you. Um, just a quick update on quality. So uh, we, we recently in the last few months received our uh, health first program highlights, uh, which is showing our year to date for 2022. We expect this will be finalized in the next month or so. And the good news story here is that, um, again, the slope is headed in the right direction. We're, we're improving and improving our quality. Uh, so we, in the Health First program, it's monitored by STARS. And so we had a half star better for our Medicaid program in 2022. 
um, and more than two thirds of a star better for Medicare. So good news, a uh, lot of work going into that, uh, but that's just a high level snapshot. Uh, next slide. And then just what to watch, which what we're watching over the next uh, few months, uh, as John mentioned before, the state budget was finalized. We're still trying to interpret uh, the pros and cons and, and, and how we do. Uh, but we are excited that the quality pool dollars for the managed care plans were refunded in the budget. Um, so that's very important to us. Um, we also know that there were additional premium dollars added in the state's budget for essential plan members, which should be a net positive revenue for health and hospitals in our managed care contracts. Um, one of the biggest things this spring is the Medicaid recertification process that's going to begin again. And so um, we'll be actively monitoring that to try to keep our enrollment as high as possible and keep people insured. And then um, slightly longer term, we'll be looking as the state is trying to approve, get, get CMS to approve its 1115 waiver, um, which again, we're hopeful will bring additional new revenues into the system that's coordinated with more social service supports. Any questions? Well, you put the 1115 waiver there. I won't go there. Well, <laughs> be another hour. Yeah. But thank you. That's a great report. And I, I should say that um, and I've, yeah, one totally excellent report, great progress and focus. Thanks. Thanks to the team. So any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. And uh, um, let's see. If you want, we just had a couple of slides. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just a couple of slides. Yeah, please. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a couple updates on test and treat. Uh, so T2 has committed this year uh, for quarter three, approximately $54.2 million in expenses. and. As always, OMB uh, has provided us with sufficient revenue through our MOU relationship with them. You can see the primary area where those costs are focused for FY23 are in testing, as most of our programming has stopped um, as of FY22. Um, a big week for us this, uh, this week, if you go to the next slide, it's the end of the federal public health emergency and FEMA funding eligibility also ends on Thursday. Um, that means that our programming will end in advance of this emergency and our new, we won't have new programmatic expenses. Um, all of the services that we were providing to respond to COVID-19, testing, treatment, and vaccination will continue to be available at NYC health and hospital locations. We'll roll that into our baseline hospital and facility operations. Um, and H&H is going to continue to operate our uh, city COVID-19 hotline to connect New Yorkers that need it to COVID-19 treatment, long COVID resources, as well as our COVID-19 centers, centers of excellence. Yeah, any questions? Mentioned Jose, Mitch and I were talking about how this is the beginning of our sixth year. And I look over at John <laughs> and we were talking about goals that we can now celebrate because setting new goals, because we've put, it, put ourselves on a firmer footing and you, of course, on a firm of financial footing for us. Um, so we should pause a moment. <laughs> and so we can mark this moment and say, you know, five years, here's where we are. And then have some celebratory goals to come. So I, just to acknowledge the whole team for the work that's been done over the long term. Well, thank you, Sally. I mean, that's nice. It's very nice. Um, and, you know, sometimes... <laughs> We, uh, we we take a moment to look over our shoulder too to see you know where we've been, but uh, we also have to look forward, right? Because there's always still new challenges ahead of us, and we are starting to you know prepare for next year's budget. We're laying out you know what we call the budget themes. Uh, it's a way for us to kind of you know focus everybody's effort and get on the same page. But you know, we we appreciate that. It's been it's been pretty good for the past past five years, but more to come for sure. Yeah. Five more years. Five more years. <laughs> Five more years. Okay. Is there any old or new business from before the committee? You're in the middle of adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.